I was selling people on 40, 50, $60,000 a month in ad spend wow. for Pinterest. I would just pick a random business on the way home. It was mostly gyms. And I'd go park in the parking lot. I'd look online who the manager was. And I'd walk in and be like, hey, Kelly and I have a meeting right now. Like, I, she might have <laughs> forgot. So I was selling wow. clients on letting me run their ads. Then we hit a million cash on our eighth month. What's a, a bridge you've burned in the past? Mm -hmm. you regret what was the biggest lesson you learned from it? One thing I did so wrong when I was younger is I was so selfish with my decision making. For me, I look at my role is putting people in the right position on the boat in order for all of us to get to where we want to go. Welcome back to another episode of Bridging the Gap. I am Bridge Rogers and today we have Brian Ostermiller on the podcast. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you, bro. So for those of you that don't know Brian, you probably know his business partner, Cole Gordon. And so he's the co-founder and CEO of Remote Closing Academy. And today we're actually joined by a live audience of their Remote Closing Ascension group. So mm -hmm. we're gonna do some Q and A at the end. So make sure for everyone watching in person, you guys write down some questions, if anything, we, we wanna go deeper on. So let's go ahead and kick it off. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. So. Before the podcast, mm -hmm. I sat down, I was like, what would be the most impactful for someone who's young, in sales, and wants to achieve what you've achieved? Because you went from, and I'd love for you to kind of share your story mm -hmm. in just a couple minutes on how you climbed from, because you didn't grow up rich, right? You didn't have a trust fund? No, zero money. No zero trust money fund. From parents. And you're how old now? 26. So he's 26, yeah. and you scaled your remote closing academy with Cole from zero to a million a month was it eight months yeah eight months eight months yeah so we're gonna we're gonna break that down for you guys on how you can scale a high ticket coaching business from zero to eight figures really really quick so to start off um, why don't you share your story and how you got started in entrepreneurship and sales yeah so I got really lucky when I was 20 dropped out of college and I kind of finessed my way into getting a job for Pinterest and uh, lied on my application and then <laughs> just like interviewed so well that the guy who was hiring loved me. So I was like 20 years old working with like 28 plus people on an outbound sales and marketing team for Pinterest. And I was obsessed with it. Cause it was like the first time where like I watched large volume transactions of money transpire. So like I was selling people on 40, 50, $60,000 a month in ad wow. spend for Pinterest. So it was like so quickly I was like, man, there's a lot of money velocity in the world. Like that was like the first big thing for me hmm. where I was like, there's a lot of money velocity. Mm -hmm. So I got obsessed with marketing and sales and learning how to sell that. And about nine months in, I just got cut off at the knees of the bonus. And so I was like, screw this. I'm going to figure out how to do it myself. Wow. And one of the ways I was the top reps at Pinterest is I realized like if I closed marketing agencies on letting me run their ads, they would onboard like 30 clients at a time. So everybody around me was onboarding like single companies and I was onboarding like 30 a day, like so high velocity. Wow. So then after I got my bonus screwed up on my way home from work, I would just pick a random business on the way home. It was mostly gyms and I'd go park in the parking lot. I'd look online who the manager was and I'd walk in and be like, Hey, Kelly and I have a meeting right now. Like I, she might've <laughs> forgot. And they don't like, I'd always know the manager's name. So they'd be like, Oh, um, okay, let me go get her. And then like everybody just thought they forgot about the meeting. And so I'd be like, Hey Kelly, I don't, you probably don't remember. We had a super quick conversation. Like, it was a while ago and she's like, okay. And then they let me have a meeting with them. So I was selling wow. clients on letting me run their ads. Wow. Like Facebook ads and yeah. Pinterest ads. So I did that for like a month. Wow. And then after a month, I was like, okay, well I'm making more money from doing this than I am from Pinterest. So I quit my job, did that for a few months and long story short, met my first business partner. Mm -hmm. He already had a group of people that he was kind of helping with this whole like SMMA thing. That okay. was when that was really big. Yeah. So we created a SMMA coaching program. Mm -hmm. It was in 2019 is when mm -hmm. we started, end of 2018. And first year, did a million cash, did a million cash our second year. And I was 20 and 21 wow. when I did that. And that's where I really became obsessed with like high ticket sales. Mm -hmm. Met Eli Wild, met a bunch of other incredible mentors and just was like really passionate about mm -hmm. the craft of like, how do I sell every single person I talk to? Hmm. Hadn't really learned marketing yet. Hadn't really learned leadership. Looking back, not understanding like leadership and org charts and company structures, why we never scaled. Mm -hmm. But I was just so good at sales that hmm. like we never had a sales team. I just collected a million for us each year. Wow. And then after doing that for two years, I had this really intense 
feeling, I'm sure everybody that's listening to this feels this to some degree of like, I feel like there's this other version of myself out there. Like that was the only way I could describe it is it was like, it was making me really emotional at the time where I was like, there's this future Brian that I know exists, but mm-hmm. I'm like not getting to him. Yeah. Like it's like, it, it was like honestly like soul wretching because man, you go to bed knowing that you're, you have so much more capacity, but you don't know like what to do about it. Mm-hmm. So I called Cole. We were friends and I was, I was explaining that to him and he was like, well, dude, just come work for me. Like, <laughs> come work for me. I'm ahead of you. And as soon as he said that, I was like, oh, he's right. Like he's done things that I haven't done yet. Like mm-hmm. I'm going to go work with him. Wow. And what was interesting is we talked for like half hour. Mm-hmm. I called my business partner. I regret this. I wish I wouldn't have done this. And I was just like, hey, dude, I'm out. And he's like, but what do you mean? Like we've been doing this for two years. And I was like, I know I have to grow. I regret that a lot. I wish I would have done it that wow. abruptly. But that's intense. That was like December 20th, January 1st, we launched RCA. Wow. And we didn't have any notion of like what it was going to be or like how it was going to grow. It was just like, let's do it. Wow. Then we hit a million cash on our eighth month. And then that segued into me being involved in a few different businesses now, mm-hmm. uh, namely a company called Springs Rejuvenation, mm-hmm. which is a stem cell and wellness company. Uh, Cole and I partnered with them in March of 2023, mm-hmm. and December of 2023, we did over $2 million in revenue. Wow. What did so, you guys start with, with that company? Zero. They, they were just doing only like referrals. It was just one wow. doctor doing referrals. So let's say 50000 a month. Wow. Uh, but no paid ads, no structure, no yeah. sales team. And uh, by, the, by like December 31st, we yeah. did $2 million in that month wow. and had 80 employees. That's insane. So now the company is growing extremely well, and now I split my time between RCA helping with some stuff with our B2B mastermind and helping with that stem cell company. Very cool. Wow. So you answered one of my questions, which is, um, what's a, a bridge you've burned in the past that you mm-hmm. regret? What was the biggest lesson you learned from it? So what, what did you learn from that experience? Just calling them up and being like, I'm out. Yeah. I mean, man, one thing I did so wrong when I was younger is I was so selfish with my decision-making and I regret all the times I was overly selfish. And I think a lot of people get that wrong because there's a lot of content in the world that's like, be focused on yourself, be selfish, like this like very ruthless mentality. And I think that that's, it's too one-sided. And Mm -hmm. I really regret not taking a moment to go like, man, like how is this going to affect him? Yeah. And if I would have thought through that and if I could advise my younger self, I would just say like, dude, this is going to be a lot for him. Like you need to have like a four month ramp to like, you should care for the relationship first mm-hmm. and then let the business stuff transpire mm. second. I love that. Let's talk about leadership for a second because I think that being selfish as a leader, how does that play out and what, what are some of the biggest lessons you've learned in growing multiple companies from zero to eight figures? Mm-hmm. So the easiest way to think about it in terms of like a mental model is my goal when I'm building a company is to basically say, okay, this is our goal as a company. It's to drive revenue, drive this much revenue. So let's say that it's a million dollars in a month. Mm -hmm. The next thing I think past that is how many people am I going to need to fulfill that goal? So I always have a quota or a target in my mind of like one sales rep equals, this is arbitrary, but let's Mm -hmm. say $100,000. So I go, okay, great. I need 10 sales reps. I need 10 closers, 10 appointment setters. And then as I'm thinking through each one of those closers, I, one of my requirements is that their individual goals fit within the structure that I need in order to accomplish the macro goal. So what a lot of leaders get so wrong is they set their goal up here and then they don't consider the goals of the people who are actually doing the day-to-day work. Mm. So for me, I look at my role as putting people in the right position on the boat in order for all of us to get to where we want to go. Mm-hmm. Like even when I interview, the number one thing I lead with is like my goal is just to get an idea of where you want to row. Mm-hmm. Because if all of us are, if all 10 closers want to make 10 grand and do 100 grand in sales, and that's their intimate goal, then I know that I'm going to achieve my macro goal of doing a million. Mm -hmm. And so many business owners, dude, I I bet you've been through this. It's like, okay, I want to do a million. So let me now just superimpose that goal onto everybody else and just like make them figure it out. Yeah, totally. So you said that one of the things you didn't know when you scaled your first company was organizational charts, leadership management. If someone is first stepping into their first leadership or management role and you were to give them like a leadership 101, management 101, Mm -hmm. how do you structure the company from a more granular perspective? Because obviously you take what their goals are and make sure that adds up for the macro goal. But what are some steps someone can take immediately upon hiring someone to make sure they're aligned so they don't have a mismatch off the beginning? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is like to elaborate on what I said about making sure the little goals fit into the big goal Mm -hmm. is... When you do hire somebody, let's say it's a sales rep, 
you have to get so crystal clear with them about what they want. Mm -hmm. And where I see so much uh, delusion in business is sales rep A wants to make 10 grand a month or sales rep B wants to make 20 grand a month. Business owners expecting them to produce $300,000 so that IE they would make $30,000 a month. So there creates a discrepancy. Or closer A wants to make 20 grand, that's their goal. But the business owner, these are just random numbers, mm -hmm. but it illustrates the point. Closer A wants to make to close 200K, make 20 grand in commissions. The business mm -hmm. owner really only wants to drive like 150 grand in revenue. Mm. That's all he wants. Mm -hmm. Or that's what he's ready for, that's what he's planning. And they don't talk about that. So then what happens is the closer feels unheard and doesn't feel like they're supported towards their goal. The business owner just mm -hmm. feels like they're dealing with this high maintenance person. They don't have a good relationship person leaves always has this immense churn. Hmm. So what Cole and I do is we just always ask our people like, what do you want? What are your goals? Mm -hmm. And we take that into very heavy consideration and we make sure that everything that we're hiring for fits within what the person already wants or mm -hmm. is, is very close to what they're looking for. Yeah. One of the things when I interviewed Cole, he said is that if he was restarting now, knowing what he knows now, he wouldn't necessarily start his own business. Mm -hmm. He would have just went and partnered with someone and scaled their thing. So for you, how did you assess uh, when you were ready to make the jump other than you getting pissed off you didn't get your bonuses? Like how can, because we have a lot of other closers in the room, how, how do they know that they've paid their dues, they have the skills to make the jump or if they should stay in the pocket a little bit more? Mm -hmm. I think growth in all areas of life should always be every, everyone's number one indicator of success. Mm -hmm. Should never be money, it should always be growth. Money is often a good scoreboard for growth, but it's not the only indicator. And for me, like both times it was like, okay, I'm done growing. There's nothing left for me to learn here. Hmm. And the reason I, I went to go partner with Cole is I would already been running my own business for two years. I had done that. And when you're at the top, it's so hard to learn from people. And dude, I was in so many masterminds. Like mm -hmm. out of that, let's say million dollars top line, we probably spent 250,000 on education and masterminds both years. Wow. And so I was like incessantly looking and like asking questions, so many big names. I was paying for advice. Mm -hmm. The only downside to a lot of masterminds is you just don't get the time and the intimacy to really like explore limiting beliefs, explore what's holding you back, like break down numbers. Everything's very like quick answers, quick synopsises, and you don't, I wasn't getting the level of mentorship that mm -hmm. I needed. And often with partnerships, you can just go find someone who's very, very good at one area mm -hmm. and that you're very good at this area and then you can complement each other and accelerate so much faster. Hmm. So with Cole, it was like, man, you have this phenomenal fulfillment system. You're so good at marketing. And Cole's remarkable at sales, it's the product. Mm -hmm. But I was like, dude, I, I know I can run phenomenal sales teams and I wanna learn so much about leadership and, and company structure and marketing from you. And then let's go put those two things together and we just ran so much faster hmm. than either of us would have ever ran alone. Hmm. I love that. So you talked about investing in your business and yourself. I've hmm. noticed a commonality between everyone that I've interviewed that have built seven, eight, nine figure companies is how much they value investing in themselves. So for you, I'm just curious the number, like how much money have you invested into yourself to get where you are today, if you had to think? Probably half half a million. Half a million? Wow. Five, five six hundred thousand. Yeah, I interviewed Cole and he was like at least 1.4, 1.6, at least. He was addicted to it for a while. He was dropping some cash. He, <laughs> and he still does, but yeah, yeah, probably around 500,000. Wow, 500,000. What's the value, do you think, in investing in mentorships and coaching? Do you think it's the fact, some people say it's just because you're paying. When you pay, you pay attention. Do you think that there's picking the right mentorship, like you said, because some of them can be not what, you're, what mm -hmm. you need in that moment. When someone, like let's say these guys, right, when they're assessing where they should invest in themselves, mm -hmm. how have you strategically done that through investing over half a million? Yeah, one thing I've done a really good job of in my career is every single time I've found someone who's smarter than me at something, I just ask them to name their price. Hmm. Like Eli Wilde, a mentor I bring up a yeah. lot, and I, I literally just went to Eli and I was like, dude, however much I need to pay you per hour of coaching, I don't care what the number is. I'll find a way to pay it to you. And I've always done that with yeah. people, health coaches, mindset coaches, people mm. who are really masterful at things. And the reason I do that is I'm a big believer that getting what you want in success is a combination of knowledge and reps. Like you can watch all the game film in the world, but if you don't practice, it doesn't matter. Right. You can practice all you want, but if you don't review game film, you're not gonna know what you need to practice. So for me, especially when I started learning sales, I was like, well, 
I can, I have a business that allows me to take as many sales calls as I want. So if I combine that with getting the fastest feedback loop possible, it's mm -hmm. inevitable that I become remarkably successful. Hmm. So like an easy example is like somebody in this room, if they were like, Brian, name your price. And I was like, yeah, it's going to be 200 grand for me to coach you one-on-one -on -one for the year. Mm -hmm they'd make $400,000 in commissions the next year. Like it's almost <laughs> inevitable. And I would help them get on better positions. I would help Are them. Are you pitching right now? No, dude, it's, it's not, even, not even an option. Not even an option. Maybe at 300, but, uh, but I just like, I would help them make so much money so yeah. fast because I could just fix so much of the problems yeah. for them so quickly. What are some of those issues that you would fix in the common sales rep that comes to you? They're making 100, 200 grand a year. And what's stopping them from getting to it? Like you said, 400, 500,000. Yeah. If somebody was at a hundred grand a year, this would be the order of effect. The first thing I would do is I would look at how every dollar that they make is being used mm -hmm. and I would force them to use it to create momentum in their life. So if somebody had 10 grand a month, I'd say you should, and this is very, this will, this will kind of disrupt like both camps of a lot of content where you have one camp where it's like, you have to be very conservative and like plan for the future. And like, you don't need anything. Like Hormozy is very big on like drive a Prius, that, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Then you have this other camp that's like, you need to invest all of your money into the future, like set yourself up. What I found to be true is that money can create massive momentum hmm. in your life. So if a closer came to me, they're making 10 grand, I'd say, we need to get you in an apartment that you absolutely love. That's mm -hmm. in a building with other successful people. Hmm. You need to drive a car that you love. You need to wear clothes that you love. Hmm. You need to hire a house manager that cooks your meals and keeps your house clean. And then you should use the other $2,000 to invest into coaching as much as you can. Wow. And then what would happen is all of a sudden they'd start having more fun. They'd start enjoying their life more. They'd start having much more momentum. The money would become more meaningful to them. Mm -hmm. That'd be number one. Number two is we just start hammering call reviews. Mm -hmm. And if you're only making 10, 12, 15 grand a month, unless the offer is just way too low ticket and it's, it's not possible mathematically, you're probably only closing at 30% and you should be closing at 45, 50%. And that's just a byproduct of skill. Mm -hmm. So we, second would be, we just do an immense amount of call reviews and fix their process. That would get them to like 200, 225. And then the third would be helping them move into a place of leadership and coaching mm -hmm. them through that relational process. Yeah, to go from two to like 400. And that's, yeah. that's pretty much what I, what I did, which, mm -hmm. which works very well. So let's say you were coaching the guy at 400. Let's say there's someone watching this, myself, et cetera. 400,000, mm -hmm. they're partnered now. How do they get to the next level? 400,000 from my experience, let's say 400,000 to a million mm -hmm. is about putting yourself in a position where the things that you're partnered in are high enough leverage. So like I think about it as like if you're selling, you're at one-to-one -one impact. You can only make so much money mm -hmm. at one-to-one -one impact. Then you start managing a team and you're like one to a small group mm -hmm. of impact. You're one to like eight. Mm -hmm. Then you start managing managers mm -hmm. and you can manage, whereas like as a sales manager, you can manage eight closers. Right now I manage a pool of highly skilled sales directors, which means let's say I have five sales directors mm -hmm. who all have eight people that they're managing. Mm -hmm. I effectively have 40 people who are influencing my income. Mm. And so I went from one person influencing my income to eight people to now 40 people mm -hmm. influencing my income. So now it's like, it's actually like, it's, I, I laugh about it with, my fiance all the time where it's like, I have four, three different companies with three different successful transaction Slack channels that I just sit and giggle over and smile all day. <laughs> Cause I have 40 different sales reps who are all selling, who I train their directors who train them. Mm -hmm. So my skill set trickles down wow. and I make money on every single one of those transactions. Genius. So each time I add a sales director that I'm coaching, I'm basically adding eight to 10 new mini revenue streams into my own income. Wow. So you technically have 40 streams of income. Essentially. Essentially. Yeah. Wow. That's funny. As you were saying that, I was thinking about, cause I've had a lot of influencers, people with millions of followers. That's essentially what they do when they start to blow up on social media is they go from one to one mm -hmm. to one to many. And they have hundreds of thousands, millions of people that they're influencing. But again, the, the dollar, dollar percentage can be smaller when you're, you're doing that. So you'd said something earlier that I want to go deep on for a second, which is belief, mm -hmm. right? I talk about my B5 success system, your belief, your body, your business, your brotherhood, your babe, having all five. Let's talk about, let's talk about belief for a second. Cause I think that is the foundation mm -hmm. upon which success is built. Yeah. I, I, one of my things I say most, like if anybody just ever comes up and flippantly is like, Brian, like, well, how have you gotten so successful? Mm -hmm. My easiest answer is just my belief systems. Mm. And 
I am just, I'm very dogmatic about what I allow my brain to think and what I transpire as my belief systems. And my feedback loop and the time I allow myself to spend in a poor belief system and a poor belief pattern is very low. Hmm. So a framework that I coach people on a lot, that mm -hmm. I coach, that I use for myself with like mm -hmm. limiting beliefs is, I believe all actions that I take or anybody takes, for whatever reason, they or myself believe is the right action to take. Hmm. I don't think anybody ever does anything that they don't genuinely believe. What's going on, guys? It's Bridger. Listen, a lot of you guys watching the podcast want to know how you guys can get a hold of me. Best way is to join my Bridge Builder Brotherhood and shoot me a DM on school. First link in the description, you've got exclusive content, monthly coaching calls with me, and I'm posting all the time in there. It's like our own little social media platform. First link in the description, completely for free. Let's get back to the podcast. Was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Second to that is all actions are driven by some sort of belief system that you have. And then all those beliefs are created by experiences that you've had in the past. So easy example is like, okay, well, if I eat steak for dinner and that makes me feel good, I believe steak equals healthy, which means I'm going to eat steak more often. But when you get really, really nitty gritty down into it, you're often not going to consciously decide your thousands of actions that you take. They're all going to be driven by beliefs. So if I know that that's true, I want to spend as much time as humanly possible recalibrating and re-examining what experiences I've had and what belief systems my subconscious is operating on so that my default actions are just good. Mm -hmm. And that transpires into relationships, it transpires into romantic relationships, business relationships, hmm. sales, everything. Hmm. How can someone start to influence those key beliefs in their own life if they're lacking it, right? Mm -hmm. Like what, what are you like a lot of people say, oh, you know, through uh, repetition of the subconscious mind, right? Thinking we're rich. What, what have you found to be successful actions that someone can take to immediately start to increase their belief? I ruthlessly examine every little thing that I do and, and question it with a lot of curiosity. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a very like simple example. And I'm also, I make myself be very rational with things and very honest. So here's an easy example. Let's say I'm booking a flight. I just had to do this with myself recently. Hmm. Say I'm booking a flight to Japan. I'm going to Japan in February. Mm -hmm. Business class tickets to there mm -hmm. for my fiance and I were 12 grand. Mm -hmm. My initial gut reaction was like, oh man, like premium or whatever is like 2000. Like, oh man, like 10,000 is a lot. Like it's only an eight hour flight. Like I immediately go into like rationalizing. <laughs> And I stopped and I was like, okay, so Brian, like what you're telling yourself is that you believe that that $8,000 difference is a significant amount of money. It's a significant enough amount of money that it's too much for you to spend on your comfort. And when I sat there and thought about it, I had to honestly look and go, okay, do I think 8,000 is too much to spend on my own comfort? And then my second order of consequence question to that is, do I believe that 8,000 is a lot because I don't make enough to where it's too little? Like it was, if it's 800, would I think that's too much? No, definitely not. Hmm. So obviously there's a difference between 800 and 8,000 and that difference is how much money I make and how much I perceive I'm worth making. 800 is so insignificant because I know I can make how I can make that so easily. It's mm -hmm. like taking one sales call. Mm -hmm. And then I had to reframe myself and be like, dude, Brian, that's like just doing a few call reviews for a sales team and you can make eight grand. Like, hmm. why, would you, why would you doubt your own capacity? Then I go book the flights and I, hmm. I get what I should get. And so, I, so many people just don't create time in their life to hyper analyze hmm. their actions. I, I think relationships are also such like a, a common example of people that just suck at relationships is because they have horrible belief systems. Hmm. Um, I'll give a super vulnerable example and mm -hmm. sorry we're going so deep on this, but I just think it is such Thank a you, beautiful yeah. point for people to understand. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a super vulnerable one, but it's, I think it's one I that everybody it. will yeah. relate with. I found myself in my, my, my fiance's name is Tyler. Mm -hmm. I found myself creating this pattern where like when we would, when I wouldn't get what I wanted in the relationship, I would like sulk. Like I would like hmm. get quiet and I would kind of like sulk and like I'd become emotionless and like, I'd almost like not throw a tantrum is a bit extreme, but like I would get, I would get very down. Like mm -hmm. I would just find myself sulking. Hmm. And after doing that a few times, I was like, Brian, like what, what is your belief system here? Mm -hmm. Like your, your action is that you're sulking. Like what is your belief? Hmm. And when I analyzed it, I was like, well, I believe that if I sulk, hmm. she'll come apologize and give me what I want. Mm. Childish. So mm -hmm. dumb. <laughs> but then I was like, well, why do I believe that? Well, because all growing up, Mm -hmm. When my mom or dad did mm -hmm. something I didn't like, mm -hmm. I would sulk 
until eventually they apologized and I got mm. what I wanted. Wow. So now in a relationship, if I don't reanalyze that, I don't get what I want. I sulk and hope that Tyler somehow perceives that sulking as not her not liking it. And so I get what I want. Wow. But that's so dumb. I don't want to operate yeah. in a relationship that way. Yeah. So then I go, okay, that experience is still valid. But what I actually want to learn from that is that while I may get what I want, it's not for the right reasons. And what my belief system is now is that when I don't get what I want, I'm going to be at the absolute best sport about it I know possible because there's inevitably going to be times where we do things that Tyler doesn't want to do mm -hmm. and I want her to be the best sport possible. Mm. And if she goes and sulks, I'm going to get pissed. And so why would I hold on to the same belief system and why would I expect her to hold on to the same belief system that I'm holding on to? Yeah. Well, that's, I appreciate you sharing that. I feel like I've found myself in the same way, a lot of different aspects, especially as you're like fighting different uh, objections on the phone. You're like figuring out how you respond to those. Some people get really aggressive. Some people like shut down. Mm -hmm. And it's why is that? And it's usually how we communicated when we were a child, right? Big time. So <clears throat> how have you noticed you've been adapting to that change that you've changed the belief on? Have you found that it's habitual that you're still going back to it and you have to consciously start to shift that? And when mm -hmm. does it become now a new habit for you that it's like, oh, I'm going to be a good sport. It's a pretty tedious process to be yeah. honest. Like you have to revisit it often and some things are deeper and some things are lighter. Like there's some things that it was a one-off experience. It's very easy to reconcile and like you just learn from it and move on. Other things are very deeply, deeply experience based. So what I've found is the more I had that experience, the more that belief was reinforced by experience, the longer it's going to take me to re rebuild that. Hmm. So like in the example of sulking i mean dude like i sulked probably 400 times in my childhood which means that's a lot of experiences reinforcing a belief system whereas like if we let's say we look at something like okay like i have money scarcity well i actually had parents who were like very encouraging about hmm. how much money i could make hmm. they thought like three four hundred thousand was a lot of money and so once i started getting to like four or five hundred thousand dollars in income i had to recalibrate what I'm worth and what I should be making. But it wasn't that hard because I had pretty supportive parents. So I didn't have a large volume of experiences reinforcing poor beliefs. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. That's very powerful. How have you uh, been able to manage, you know, cause you're engaged now. Mm -hmm. Congratulations by the Thank way. Thank you. That's awesome. So you work, I would love to talk about your schedule mm -hmm. and then I would like to talk about the dynamic in the relationship as you fostered that. Cause it seems like you guys are pretty happy. And I think a lot of guys, struggle to find that right we see a lot of guys there's even programs movements out there for guys that have lost touch with their families in business mm -hmm. so how how is your schedule arranged and how are you prioritizing time with tyler so you don't lose both sides yeah so i guess uh, before the schedule part with tyler um i've been i got married when i was 20 and divorced when i was 23 now i'm engaged again and the biggest one of, one of the biggest differences between this relationship and my first one was how aligned we are in our vision for what we want to build and accomplish mm. together. And I think so many people discount the crucialness of that in a romantic relationship. But like if, if you and I were to become business partners and your vision was to build a $100 million company and my vision was to build a million dollar company, mm -hmm. we would naturally have discrepancies on almost everything. We would fight about everything. Yeah. And so if you get in a romantic relationship and her vision is to have 10 kids and do all this stuff and yours isn't, you're going to fight about everything. So with Tyler and I, we, one of the things we talk about the most above all else is like, what's our vision? What do we want to do hmm. and what do we want to accomplish together? Hmm. And then everything for me is filtered off of that. Hmm. Um, it's also a relationship where it's so easy for me to put it as my number one priority in life. Hmm. So I always thought for a long time, like, okay, like work, success, business, that'll always be number one. And then like family, kids, that'll come after. And then I met somebody who was worth putting first and that changed it for me. So now wow. when I plan my day and I plan my week, the first question I actually ask myself is like, what does Tyler need from me this week? And like, hmm. how do I need to serve her? Hmm. So if I had a blank calendar, the very first thing I do is like, where's date night? How much time are we going to spend together? Like, what does she need from me? What does she has going on? That goes on the calendar first. Hmm. Second to that, in terms of actual scheduling, I've messed around so much with different time blocking things and different wake up times. The biggest thing I've learned is I have to schedule out my week no matter what. Yeah. I've, I've tried every format of not doing that, doesn't work. So I'll weekly plan on Sundays and I basically just look at all my metrics for all my companies 
And then I just start filling in time with what I need to focus on for the week. I usually work from about seven in the morning till about, I, I, I'll take calls from eight to three. So usually I'll do like busy work, day prep stuff from seven to eight, take calls from eight to three, usually go to the gym or get out of the house from like three to 435. Then I'll like clear messages, finish up work from five to six, six to eight thirty, nine o'clock. Tyler and I will do something together. Sometimes I go to jujitsu, sometimes she does her own thing, but we'll have, I'll do something unrelated to work and then I go to bed. So I keep it pretty simple. I like that schedule. I, I've, I've played around with like working all the time. Have you gone through seasons of that? Do you think it's necessary when you aren't in a relationship? Like, did you work during that evening or do you think it's still important for, for high performers to have that couple hours a night where they're just completely not focused on work? I think everybody has to go through a season if you want to do things in a short amount of time where you compress time. So in between my first, my last relationship and Tyler, I basically had a two year span where yeah, I would work from 7 a.m. till 8 p.m. about six days a week. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a year and a half, two years. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody that wants to condense time, that's the easiest way to do it. Yeah. Because it's not a matter of like, should I or shouldn't I? It's a matter of like, how long do I want it to take to get yeah. to where I want to go? That's a good point. So it's like, okay, let's say it takes 10,000 hours to make a million dollars a year. Well, you can accomplish that 10,000 hours in two years or 20 years. It's up to you. And so I really use those two years to compress as much time as possible. And now I actively am okay with the fact that I'm slowing down my success, yeah. my, my accomplishment to spend time with Tyler. But it's almost like I'm not, I'm slowing down one area, but this other area is so much more beautiful that it's such an equal and above equal trade-off. Hmm. I love that. Where do you feel like, as you were going through your entrepreneurial journey, you made you had the biggest blind spots and mm -hmm. made the biggest mistakes that slowed down time? Because you're talking about speeding up time. Where could you have sped up even more? There was like a speed bump in the road. And then I'm gonna ask you about a, a cool story you told me about. Yeah. Uh, you know, the other day we we're hanging out. Yeah. The biggest thing is I didn't treat people well. I didn't mm -hmm. take care of people. And one of the things that's given me the most velocity, especially in, in the last year, is having such phenomenal relationships. So, for example, like when I said, like having these sales directors who can grow these companies inter interdependently of me, those all come from putting them first and putting relationships first and taking care of people. Oh. And I have closers that have worked for me for like two, three, four years. And I have very, very low churn on my companies now. Hmm. Whereas when I was a younger entrepreneur, dude, I was a jerk. And I was so like, we have to perform, we have to perform, we have to perform. And it wasn't that I was trying to be mean. It wasn't that I was trying to be rude. It was just that I would respond to any sort of lack of performance with a lot of harshness. Yeah. A lot of intensity, a lot of harshness, hmm. very little empathy. Mm -hmm. So then what happened is I'd have churn on my teams. And I would, my average setter was on the team for like three months and the average closer was on the team for six months. Hmm. Whereas now it's like the average setter's with us for eight to 12 months and a closer will close to me for one to three years. Wow. And especially early on for any business owner, sales director, sales manager, that churn will kill your momentum faster than anything else. Hmm. Like if you have a top closer, they could be bringing in $2 million a year in revenue. But if you're a jerk and you burn that relationship, you literally are saying no to $2 million a year in cash by making them leave. So let's say you have two closers that produce $2 million. I mean, dude, you piss them off. You don't take care of them. That's $4 million a year. So then let's say you're a sales director who gets 5% revenue share. You just took $200,000 off your paycheck by not taking care of people and by not helping them get what they need. Hmm. Wow. So that was the biggest area that you felt like you could have just slowed down. What are some changes you've made in your communication that has resulted in the higher, mm -hmm. higher, or I guess it'd be less churn? Yeah, the biggest thing now is I, I spend so much more time considering the person and what they have going on in life hmm. and how, they need, how I need to communicate with them to help them win. And I, I also just take things so much less personal. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, it was like a closer not performing. I internalize as like, you're making me look bad. Like this is making us look bad. Like you're making me look like a screw up. Like you're making, you're hurting my image. And like, I hate like the stupidity. It was just like, I turned it into this big narrative. Now I've worked through all of that to where it's like, I just look at my people that work with me and it's like, how can I serve you? How can I lead you? How can I help you be the best you possible? And I genuinely put that first and performance stays the same, but you get a lot more loving relationships. Hmm. Yeah. You said something earlier that I think I want to emphasize, which is 
until you know what your vision is for life, you can't make a decision on who your business partner is, who your life partner is, mm -hmm. what the right opportunity vehicle is for you until you get clear on you and where you're going to go. Where do you feel like that inner work of like getting clear, connecting with God, the universe, whatever you believe in, and getting it on paper, making a decision on this is who I'm going to be, this is where I'm going to go, sets someone up to have those opportunities come to them? Mm -hmm. I think it's a deeply spiritual process. I spent an immense amount of time, I still do, I spend a lot of time and have a lot of habits that surround silence. Hmm. So I do a lot of things, I go for a lot of walks, I meditate, I sit in the sauna, I I do my best to incorporate as much silence into my life as possible, hmm. especially during those two years when I wasn't in a relationship. Like I didn't listen to music. I didn't watch TV. Like as soon as I was done working, dude, sometimes I would just sit on my couch. Hmm. Like I would just sit there hmm. and I would just think and think and think and think. And what happens is when you reflect enough, you start to realize what your true potential is. Hmm. And it's hard to be in tune with that when you have noise. Because other people are telling you what your vision should be and what your potential should be. Yeah. Like if I just opened up your Instagram right now and hit your explore feed, we'd see 10 pieces of content mm -hmm. of people superimposing what your vision would be within within 10 minutes. Yeah. And so that's not that that's wrong. It's helpful to guide, mm -hmm. but everybody's going to have a different idea of like, this is what I'm capable of. This is what's important to me. This is what intrinsically is what I want. Mm -hmm. I think a really good guiding question is like, what would I want my life to look like if nobody else could ever see it? If mm. only I knew that my life looked the way that it did, what would I want? What would I care about? Hmm. And I filter a lot through that. Hmm. So like, if you look at something like, okay, great. Like, do I want to buy two Lamborghinis? Well, I actually don't. Like, I don't, I'm not that much of a car person. I would only be doing that for people to know that I had two Lamborghinis. It's the only <laughs> reason. So I'm not going to do it. And then when I look at something like, what do I want my family unit to look like? It's like, man, I want to have a huge posterity. Like I want to have six, seven kids. I want to spend time with grandkids. Like that's what I want. Hmm. And even like for me when I was younger, that was hard because man, you start watching a lot of business guys and that's not a vision or value for most of them. For mm -hmm. most like really successful people, it's like multiple relationships, like Andrew Tate, big movement on like not being monogamous and having... So you start to consume too much of this information and it dilutes your soul of like what you actually want. Yeah. Yeah, it's so true. Let's talk about principles versus rules. Because mm -hmm. I've seen you, you know, speak on stage at some of the events that we've been a part of and like that was one of the things that really stood out and that I know you have like a really strong opinion on. Want to mm -hmm. talk about that for a second? Yeah, it's something I actually coach people on all the time, sales reps especially. Mm. And this ties into like schedule, routines, how to think mm. about how to spend your time, relationships. There's so many people that want to tell you what the rule of success is. And if you go pick up any self-development book, it'll be some sort of title of like the morning routine that makes you successful in less, in more layman's terms. Every self-development thing is like, here's the code, here's the key that unlocks the chest to success. And for so long, I was obsessed with this idea of like, what is this equation of rules that I can conglomerate together that makes me successful? And what I learned is when you actually start studying the universe, nature, what's true and what flows, dude, how many things in nature are binary rules? Mm -hmm. You have oxygen. And even then there's things that break that. You have gravity. Even then there's things that break that. You have the necessity for food to some degree. Mm -hmm. But when you actually start to really distill down, like what are the immovable, unchangeable, everyday, yes or no, binary things in the world? So few, right? almost nothing. So if that's true in nature, if that's true in the world, why would that be true of success? Why would that be true of having a successful morning? So then I started to break that down and I, I also got a lot of inspiration from Ray Dalio. I think that there's a huge significance that his book is called Principles not called rules. Yeah. I think it's because he's so wealthy and smart that he's realized almost nothing fits into a rule-based system. Hmm. And the reason I help closers understand that so closely is what will lead to burnout faster than anything I've seen is creating this intense rule-based system that you tell yourself you have to follow that inevitably you don't. And then it creates self-doubt issues. Mm. It creates self-confidence issues. It's the same reason like anybody who says like, okay, I'm going to get in shape. I'm never going to eat sugar again. will never get in shape because they're going to eat sugar. And then what happens is they eat sugar and it doesn't stop at just one cookie. They've mm -hmm. now broken their rule. So since we broke the rules, let's just, the, the gates have opened. Let's eat 4,000 calories because like I'm going to have to get back on this rule-based system tomorrow. So like, let me just make it worth it while yeah. the rules are broken. What's going on, guys? It's Bridger. Listen, a lot of you guys watching the podcast want to know how you guys can get a hold of me. Best way is to join my Bridge Builder Brotherhood and shoot me a DM on school. First link in the description, you've got exclusive content, monthly coaching calls with me, 
and I'm posting all the time in there. It's like our own little social media platform. First link in the description, completely for free. Let's get back to the podcast. And so, whereas I look at everything of like, what is the principle that I want to live by? So if we use something like health and sugar, Mm -hmm. principally eating a little bit of sugar is not a big deal. Mm -hmm. Principally eating a lot of sugar has some negative side effects, negative consequences. Mm -hmm. So I just look at everything as like, what do I want my guiding principles to be? Mm -hmm. And then let me operate within the realm of that principle as much Mm -hmm. as possible. Morning routines, it's like, okay, we know that waking up at the right time and having enough time to to prepare for your first activity is going to yield the highest outcome of success. But if your first call is at 10 a.m., why do you need to wake up at five? Just wake up at eight. Like you can do the same two hour thing that you want to do between eight and 10 as you could between five and seven. It makes no difference. Yeah. And even within that two hours, like you don't even need two hours. For me, it's like principally, okay, if I'm going to be talking to a group of people at nine, I want to get some movement in. I want to make sure I'm as awake as possible. I want to be hydrated. I want to be fed. I'm going to need two hours to go for a walk drink some water, take a sec to gather myself and go do that. Mm -hmm. But how I accomplish those things could be 900 different ways. Hmm. I love that. I want to ask you a question that's really, have you seen Undercover Billionaire? I have. You have? Yeah. Yeah. So I asked this question uh, on one of the other podcasts and it, it, I think it was, it was helpful in the video getting the most views that we've had. And is, it is, if we were to strip Brian Mm -hmm. of all of his connections, all of his money, Mm -hmm. and we only left you, with your skills, what you know, how quickly could you build a million dollar business, right? If you had 90 days, gun to the head, you, you were on the show, nine, undercover, we'll call it undercover millionaire. Mm-hmm. You had to become a millionaire in 90 days, build a million dollar business. Walk us through three to five steps that you would take. How would you identify the business model? How would you grow it? How would you scale it? Million, knowing what you know now. Million in valuation or cash flow? A uh, million in cash flow. Okay, million in cash flow. So if I'm optimizing for cash flow, I need to do something with a high yield and a high ROI. Okay. So here's probably what I would do. If I only had 90 days. 90 days. Okay, here's what I would do. I'm in a city, first thing I'd do is I'd look up whoever the top real estate agent is in the area. And I'd call the top five realtors. Okay. Get a meeting with every single one of them. Hmm. And I'd go pitch them and I'd say, hey look, here's the deal. Here's all my skill sets. I've already done a market analysis research on your area. I'd go to the library. Mm -hmm. I'd look at all the market. I'd look at Mm -hmm. where the highest yielding potential uh, real estate flips could be. And I'd go make a business plan for all five of them. Mm -hmm. And I know without a doubt that if they had the meeting with me, they would take me up on it. Hmm. So then I'd say, look, here's all I'm asking. We're gonna form this business together where you and I are gonna go flip three houses. And all I need you to do is fund it. I'll do all the work. Do every single piece of the work. So I'd get five of them, let's say four say yes. And then that means I'm going to be doing 12 deals. I'll do three real estate property flips with all four. Hmm. So I do 12 deals. It means I only have to cash flow about $80,000 per deal. So if I go buy a property and I renovate it and I can get an $80,000 transaction, which I could, uh, then I'd make a million dollars and I'd build wow. a million dollar company. That's fascinating. You get into real estate, use your skills. I like, I like what you said there though, which is, you would go to someone top in the industry who already has status, already has authority. That's kind of what I did with Greg, right? Where I was mm-hmm. like, I'm going to use his status, his authority, his, his audience, and then I'm going to provide a value. I'll do all the work, I'll, I'll everything, and then you take a percentage. That's genius, yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the second idea that I have okay. is I'd go to those same, I'd find the top four brokers, yeah. and I would ask them if I could take a top side percentage on any net new deals that I help their realtors generate and find. And I would consult all their realtors, help every single one put a lead generation system in place with Facebook ads. And if I got four brokerages that all had 10 realtors, that'd be 40 realtors. If I got 30 to enact the plan and I got all of them to do three extra transactions at $50,000 per, that'd be about $15 million in transaction value. Basically, the math would also equate to about a million dollars in revenue. Wow. I love that. So I'm seeing a common theme. Finding a high income niche, partnering with them, and then doing the marketing and sales, which, or I guess it would be the, the sales. Mm-hmm. One of the things that I think is interesting is you don't have a crazy amount of, or you haven't done a crazy amount of the marketing in these businesses, right? Like you, like we talked about before, like your main lane, sales, mm-hmm. operational sales, and leadership, mm-hmm. right? So how can someone watching this identify where their superpower could be? Because Cole, I mean, he's great at sales, Good at manager. Yeah, I think he's better at marketing. Like he would he, tell you. He's world class. Like he's marketer. a. He's literally one of yeah. the. He's, yeah. He's one of the best, if not the best, marketers in the world. So, how do you, how did you think 
he did it? How did you do it as far as finding the it factor? Mm -hmm. Man, that's an interesting one. I think everybody intrinsically knows what they're best at. Hmm. And I think you see it all through childhood. Like, hmm. I think if you took a kid and you just observed them, they would show you what they love doing. For me as a kid, dude, like, I loved, I, dude, I was taking high school debate classes in, like, seventh grade. And I just loved all things communication so much. Hmm. I spoke every single chance I got. I was doing leadership stuff. I loved it. And so I think it's just such a natural, I guess you could almost say genetic part of me to love communication and to love influence of people. Hmm. And I think everybody, if you just observe them and they let themselves ask themselves honest questions about what they love, they'd get pretty damn close to doing a skill-based revenue driving thing that's really close to what they love. Hmm. I love that. Where else do you feel like we haven't gotten yet in this conversation? that if this was the last podcast you ever did, mm -hmm. God forbid, uh, where else do you feel like we haven't shined a light on your greatness or superpower? It's mm, a good question. I think one thing I, I do probably better than anybody else in the world that I've seen is truly enact really high velocity performance at very, very fast. Hmm. And I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the teams I oversee, Michael's on it, who's here. Mm -hmm. There's a closer on the team uh, older gentleman who the first the, like I think it was like August had closed like three deals hmm. and I did two one-on-ones with him and the next month he closed 36 deals in this second month and I can do that pretty routinely with people where like anybody that's underperforming even anybody here who's been on group calls with me like so many people here wow super struggling underperforming a month later they get on a group call with me and they're like dude what you told me I made twice as much money wow like, has anybody here had that experience? Just flip things so fast. Half the hands went up, by the way. And uh, so I have a lot of thoughts and methodologies around that. It's a lot of what we talked about with limiting beliefs and, and how to really elicit performance. But that's, that's what I think I'm the best in the world at. Mm. Okay. So you've done dozens, hundreds of these one-on-ones that have grown. Mm -hmm. Think back through those conversations that had the biggest imp or uh, biggest uh, impact, like they had the biggest change, like the two to 36. And what were some of the things that you said that when you were looking at the guy on Zoom, you could literally see something change in his eyes. Cause, cause I've had similar conversations, not to the volume, but I've seen a couple people flip the switch and it's really fun to watch. Mm -hmm. So like if someone's watching this can get that same little hit if they can't afford 300 grand a year. Yeah. <laughs> they should probably do the latter, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, I think what everybody needs to hear, and like if I was just having like a mass one on one with everybody watching yeah. this, here's what I'd say I'd say you deserve success and you have so much more capacity than you're letting yourself unlock. And there's a part of you that's scared, and there's a part of you that's fearful, and that very part of you is exactly what's holding you back. Now, like you're thinking, like, Brian, like, how do I start to change that? What do I do? Here's a simple answer everything that you want, you have to understand that it's okay if you don't want it. It's okay if you're not successful. It's okay if you don't make a lot of money. It's so okay if you, if you don't wanna be a closer. It's so okay if you don't wanna do business. But if you do wanna have those things, if you wanna make a lot of money, if you wanna be a highly skilled closer, you have to accept, you must accept that you have to do the requisite things in order to get there. So if you're not handling objections, you have to go as hard as you can and handle every single objection if that thing that you want is truly what you want. And if it's not, then you should just love yourself enough to let it not be what you want and push it to the side. And so many people and what I ultimately end up uncovering with people is they either want something that's over here to their left and they are actually looking to their right hmm. or they should just be doing something entirely different than what they're doing. But I think this, this really intense fear that people have around this like unknown and like what if this bad things happen, like almost like monster in the closet keeps people so stifled. Hmm. And I think I can help anybody be a remarkably successful closer. And the process of that is just starting to shed their fears and anxieties and worries. Mm -hmm. It's like with that example I gave earlier about the guy that had such a big month, the way the one-on-one -on -one went is I basically just said, hey, like, what are you experiencing? What are you feeling? And he basically just said, like, I'm new on the team. I don't want to overstep. Like, I, I just, hmm. I know that I could do more. I just don't want to overstep. And I said, wow. hey, can I be really honest with you? And he said, yeah. And I said, if you continue what you're doing, you will get let go from the team and you're not going to get what you want. And he was like, okay, I know. And I said, you have full permission from me 
to do and say whatever you need to do and say as aggressive as you need to be to swing the pendulum and close. Wow. You have full permission. Like nothing bad's going to happen. It's impossible. The only bad thing that could happen to you is you not doing that. Like you holding on to fear is the only bad thing. Nothing else bad can happen. I promise. Like you're so safe hmm. to just go all out. It's the safest thing you can do. Hmm. And I think once people assign the word like safe and secure hmm. with just going all out, yeah. then that fear dissipates. Almost everybody gets successful pretty fast. What would you say is the first skill that someone young that wants to be an entrepreneur and wants to be successful should master to have the highest chance of making a, a six figure plus income and setting themselves up to be a successful business owner? Very first is just hard work. And I know mm -hmm. that sounds very cheesy, especially because I've talked so much about like limiting beliefs and stuff, but behind every single successful person that you've interviewed that anybody's met is a season of their life where they had a pretty insane ballistic all out attack on their day and on their work period. I think the very first thing is like, you have to learn to be almost like intimate with that discomfort of just hmm. intense work. Yeah. And like what I don't highlight very much is when I was working at Pinterest, I personal trained from 4 a.m. till 7 a.m. Wow. And I had three clients, two, two sets of old women at four and five, and then a young couple at seven. Wow. I'd work out real quick, drive to Pinterest, be at the office from eight till six usually. Yeah. And then at first I tried like doing a drop shipping store stuff at night and then it was my agency. Yeah. And so I, for like a, the first year I did that, I was working 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And then when I was taking calls for my own company, I mean, dude, my schedule once calendar was open from 4 a.m. till midnight. Like there were times I'd wake up to an alarm at 3.40, like stumble into my desk and like turn on the, like just be blinded. Wow. Get it closed, like get back in bed for a few. <laughs> Cause I was just like, I'm gonna open up my net so wide wow. that it's impossible I don't win. That's and crazy. I've been through a lot of seasons of just insane hour input. Mm -hmm. So I would say that's, that's the most important premise is like, I think a lot of people are, especially in our age, this day and age, are very um, soft towards inputs and hours. And I don't like saying like grinding, but mm -hmm. really like they're very soft towards that Hard notion work. of just being fully dedicated to something. Yeah, I think that's important. Yeah, I remember when I was 17 and I was taking 15 credits in college, I was, uh, you know, bagging groceries and I had like maybe a couple hours in the morning at night. I was like, I was like, I hate this. And then I like, I flipped the switch. I was like, you know what? I'm going to learn how to love what I hate. And mm -hmm. I think if you can learn how to love what you hate and like love the work, then like whatever you set your mind to, you, you can, you can be successful. So I remember when you were coaching me, actually, when I was growing the Kino body sales team, one of the, the tips you gave me that I still use is like in the morning, like I was like, how do you read so many books? Like he's read, Brian's reading a couple books a week. And he's like, well, you know, I, I go for a walk every morning, pretty much every morning. And I listen mm -hmm. when I'm, when I'm walking. So what would you say someone who wants to go from 200 grand, 300 grand, 400 grand, to a million with their sales skills or their leadership mm -hmm. uh, and what were the books you read to go from like that two to 400 to that million mm. like what are 10 books that like you keep going back to re read study obsess over okay let me see if i can make a definitive list okay. i'd say number one laws of human nature okay. by robert green that's yeah. like phew, masterful good huh number okay. two mastery by okay. robert green number three principles by ray dalio um, number four is this book called Transformations by Robert A. Johnson. It's my favorite book. It's where mm. my tattoo comes from. Hmm. Favorite book in the world. Uh, number five or six is a same by Robert A. Johnson called He. Mm -hmm. Also incredible book. Um, then I'd say Power Versus Force. Mm -hmm. Love that book. Um, man, that's such a good list. If you just studied those over and over, this is a sleeper. Nobody's heard of this one. It's hard, it's hard to find. It's called the NLP workbook. It's hmm. like a big blue book. Is it like this thick? No, oh, it's, okay. it's probably like 250 pages. Okay. And then there's another one called uh, the NLP handbook. Did you get those from Eli? Uh -huh. no? Yeah, I think I've yeah. seen them sitting in his place. Dude, they're insane. They're, looking, yeah. they're sleepers though. I don't talk about those very much. Okay. They're like dense. They're like the dark arts of communication, dude. Wow. <laughs> it's, they're intense. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but I would say probably if you like studied that list pretty damn intensely, you'd get pretty far pretty fast. Give us three more, three more books. Three more. Three more bi like business. Those are a lot of like mindset, communication. Like what are some business building, like understanding? Yeah, I would say all of Jim Collins. Okay. That can take up a few, but like good to great is phenomenal. All of Jim Collins books are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. 
And then I'd also say all of Patrick Lencioni's books. Mm. I'd say those encompass the remaining. Jim Collins has uh, three or four books that are really good. Uh, and then same with Patrick mm-hmm. Lencioni. Yeah. Lencioni, how do you spell that? L-E-N-O-C-I, I think. L-E-N-C-I. You can just... Yeah, you can just look. You got it. Um, okay, I want you. I want you to tell one more quick story, and then we'll open up for questions. Mm-hmm. The, la- the last thing I want to talk about when when you and I were at a Thanksgiving about a year and a half ago, um, I was like asking you how things are going, whatever. And you're like, dude, like we just got out of this like crazy situation. And you start telling me the story. I'd love to open it up, but Brian's about to share a story on how he overcame pretty much eight hundred thousand dollars of refund requests mm-hmm. in like couple days like overnight yeah so it, tell that story because that's that was for me it was not like i was like glued the this whole was time. like dude this is like the dark night of my soul <laughs> is this story so the 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 first part i'll tell the first part and then the context and i handled okay. it so dude it was a saturday night and i was laying in my movie room by myself and unfortunately i'd like just been smoking some weed like i was massive chilled out it was like 7 30 and our operations person for rca called me and he was like stammering and he was like, dude, dude, I need you to get on Zoom with me right now. And I was like, Trent, what's wrong? Like, dude, it's seven. he's like, I need you to get on Zoom. Um, we're getting a lot of emails. And I was like, what? <laughs> and he's like, we have to get on Zoom right now. And he pulled up the support inbox and there was like 60 emails, all with the exact same subject line, all with the exact same copy, just from 60 different senders. And they all basically said like refund or I'll report you to the FTC. And... Um, and so they all basically had this body of text that was identical that said, like, we don't think that you upheld your end of our agreement with RCA. Like, we want all of our money back right now or we're going to file a chargeback. So we were like, damn, like, if all these people file a chargeback, like, we'll lose our payment processor and it's, let's just say, half a million dollars in cash. So I called Cole and we started talking about it. And I was like, okay, here's what we're going to do. First thing, we're going to get our attorney on the line because it was all bullshit. Like all yeah. of it was people that had gotten on teams, gotten jobs, like had phenomenal experiences. Wow. So that's, at first I was like, this makes no sense. Like we started going through all these people. All of them had posted wins, posted testimonials. What? Like I was like, this is insane. Wow. So I, I got our attorney on the phone. He prepped a, a letter that basically said, what you're, what you're requesting is invalid and doesn't hold up in court. If you'd like to have a further conversation about this, you can book a call with our team here. Our team was just me. And my thought was like, okay, if I can get all these people on Zoom with me, I can de-escalate them. Whoa. So all of a sudden, we send out that email to all of them. And for the next three weeks, from 3 p.m. till 8 p.m., I had 30-minute calls, Monday through Friday, just back to back. So come to find out that there was a woman who was on my closing team who wanted to get promoted, and we said no. And so she quit. And she decided that we were the devil for that. And she got every woman that she had ever closed over the course of a year in a group chat. And she said, here's the email copy. I want all of you to send this. And they all did it. And so for a month, I took a call with every single one of those women. And I de-escalated every single one. And we ended up refunding, I think, $30,000 total. Wow. But I de-escalated every single person. Wow, and your program's what, like, what was that at the time? Eight grand, 10 grand, six grand, something yeah, like that? Yeah, it was like 9,000. So you only, yes, yeah, so you only refunded like three or four people. Yeah. Out of like, wow, that's crazy, man. Yeah. So what, what did you learn in communication through, I mean, how many conversations was that? It was probably like 100, 100 Dude, conversations. Dude, it was a lot. I think I talked to yeah. 60 different women in three weeks. Yeah, so you talked to 60 women. Out of those 60 women, like, what did you learn about yourself and communication and patience and like, what was the biggest lesson from that, yeah. all of that? Biggest lesson is if you just, if you ask a good question and let people talk, most of the time they'll find the, they'll find the way to where you're trying to get them to go. Mm. So like every single one of those calls basically went like this. Hey, I just want to let you know that my main goal here is that you're heard and that we find common ground and that both of us walk away from this happy. That's my main goal here. Hmm. So to kick things off, can you tell me a little bit about like what you're feeling and where you're coming from? Hmm. And most of the calls, I gave that frame, asked that question, they would talk for about 10 minutes. And then after they talked, about half of them would go, you know what, like after I say all this out loud, I actually, I, I just only did this because I was told to, I feel kind of silly. So about half of them said. Hmm. I would say the top, the next 25% after that said, these are some, some frustrations that I have. And most of them I said, hey, actually like those frustrations are valid. I think we could have done a little bit better in those areas. I'm so sorry that happened. What do you think is fair? 
And the 30,000 actually was compromised of a lot of like just partial refunds. And so a lot of hmm. like the next 25, I said like, what do you think is fair? And most of them said, well, I paid you $9,000. Can you just refund 2,000? Hmm. And I said, you know what? Actually, given everything you told me, I think that's super fair. We'll do wow. that, no problem. Here's the release form I need you to sign. Please sign it. Wow. And then another 25% were really angry. They, they got really incaptivated by this woman who was leading this movement. So I had to ask a second question, which was just like, hey, like if you were me, what would you do in this situation? How would you handle it? If it was like your business and your employees that were being threatened, that's what I said. If it was your business mm. and your employees that were being threatened, how would you handle this? Hmm. And as soon as I asked that, it was like they just poof, deflated and realized wow. like, oh, this is actually affecting people. And they said, you know what? Like, actually, I would just give a partial refund. Hmm. And so then we found a number that made sense and gave them a partial refund. And we, every single person signed a release form. And it actually ended up being a really kind of cool experience in hmm. some way. Well, yeah, that's, that's incredible, man. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, we're going to open it up for questions now. Oh, wow, look at all the hands. Yo, Bryce, let's get some B-roll on the phone vertical, yeah, yeah. Your, your phone. Yeah. And uh, let's get some B-roll of that. Um, uh, who wants it the most? Yeah, yeah, I'll go first. Let's go this guy right here. All right, so I love what you were talking about with how great you handle your one-on-ones, and obviously for our conversation earlier, that's something I'm wildly interested in. So you're training a sales leader. You're in a conversation with them on how to do one-on-ones like you, but you only have five minutes to instill your wisdom to them. Given your wildly good success rate on that, what are the key two to three things that you would want to instill into that sales leader to have one-on-ones to the level of success that you have? Get hyper clear on what your people want and make sure it's authentic to them. Get hyper clear for you as a leader of what's holding them back, not what they say is holding back them back, but what you know is actually holding them back and then ruthlessly train them and uphold them on fixing those things. But what so many middle leaders miss is that middle part where like I always come to a one-on-one already knowing how the person needs help every single time. Like if I have one-on-ones, I'm prepping for them in the morning and thinking about them ahead of time. I don't ever get on a one-on-one without already knowing what my advice and counsel and training is going to be. It's never reactive. So then I rehash, like, what do you want? What is their goal? Do you have an idea of what the problem is? I help realign them on what the actual problem is, and then we just attack it. Mm. And I'm sure that would be useful as well for a sales rep to be able to do with themselves. Of course, to yeah. To have that same mentality. Because so mm-hmm. really it's what they have to do on a sales call, right? What does this person want? What's holding them back from getting it? And then let me ruthlessly attack their objection. So when you said earlier, when you're talking about the rep that you took from two sales a month to 36 a month, um, you said like how holding on to fear was the only bad thing kind of in that situation to let him like flip that switch. So do you have like a mental model that you use to help him better understand or was it more of just making the decision and staying out of the fear mindset? So much of it is just identification. Like, it's so easy to just get in a rhythm of like, you wake up, you check your phone, you eat breakfast, you get on calls, you get off calls, you go to the gym, you watch TV, you go to bed. And so like, what I really do on those one-on-ones is I just bring to light and bring to recognition what the monster in the closet is. Like, you're only scared of what's under the bed because you're too scared to look under the bed. And then your mom comes in and she looks under your bed and all you're not scared anymore. Well, so what was actually the fear? It was the unknown. It was like the unawareness. It's the same thing as adults. Like, People just get in such intense tracks that they don't ever just have a second to go like, man, like what's my monster in the closet right now? And then you just show them, like you open the doors to the closet and it's like, look, you're just scared of screwing up. That's dumb. Stop. And then it's just, once that awareness is present, it dissipates. Cool. Like it. Let's go this gentleman right here. And then Bryce, let's do horizontal for the YouTube. Gotcha. I got a question for Brian. I've heard you talk about the masculine and feminine energies, and mm-hmm. I know you've looked a lot into it. Can you talk about how you tap into both? Mm-hmm. I could tell maybe in the beginning towards it was very masculine, and then you progress sort of learning about both energies and mm-hmm. talk about, you know, what situations call for what. Yeah, Robert A. Johnson, those two books I recommended, talk about it a lot. But the main thing I learned is everybody has a different set point with where they live within masculine and feminine energy. And every man has feminine energy inside of him. And so when I talk about like relationships, that's a very feminine thing. Like women and feminine energy is very relationship based. To express love and to express care and to express empathy, it's very feminine. It's not a masculine trait to do that. But the reason that's so important to me is because I want people that I lead to know that I care about them. And if I'm so like masculine and dogmatic that it's just like everything is transactional, 
then there's going to be a part of their soul, the feminine of their soul, that's like, he doesn't love me. He doesn't care about me. He doesn't care if I live or die. And that can only exist for so long before people feel that absence and crave it somewhere else. It's also important to me in relationships because I want to honor my fiance and her feminine energy in every way possible. So I have to know it in order to honor it. I love it. We're at 215. How much more time? We, we can, we'll, we'll wrap up the questions. We're good. We'll wrap up the questions. So earlier you guys were talking about strategies and tactics for a person to go from 200K to a million. Um, is there anything like that similar for people that are under 10K a month? To break like 15 to 20, 25, 30, something Work like that. Work as humanly possible. Work as humanly hard as you can. Just go as hard as you can. Open your net as wide as you can, as work as hard as you can, and learn from everybody you can. And it'll happen pretty quick. I have a good question. Cause whoa, whoa, whoa. Use the mic. We'll wrap on this question. Mm -hmm. It goes hand in hand. Yeah, it sounds good. Just, just hold it. You don't have to. Yeah, I'll put it back. Um, I have a good question. So I think vehicle, mm -hmm. if you have a great skill set as a closer can determine two, three, four X what you make. Agreed. Could you walk me through a couple of metrics that if you had to close and you weren't able to, to, to do what you do now, but you had to close, where would you look in a company for mm -hmm. healthy signs? Okay. This is a good vehicle for me to make like the money I want. A lot of it. If you look at marketing numbers, an immense amount of it is how expensive their traffic is yeah. and how efficient their marketing is. So I'll give you an example with one of the companies, one of the subsidiaries within one of the companies that I oversee, our average cost per booked call is like $10 for wow. a $10,000 product. That's crazy. And so if that's true, that tells me there's an immense amount of velocity behind that. Whereas like if somebody started running ads for a company and their cost per booked call was like 350, 400, $450, there's so little margin and velocity hmm. in that company unless the price point's ridiculously high. Hmm. So there's this equation that you can look at of like, what's the price point that I'm selling it? How expensive it is to drive traffic to that? And that'll give you a good idea of like how much margin and velocity there is in the hmm. middle. I love that. Um, I know that people watching virtually on the podcast are gonna wanna get more Brian. I know there's not much to go around because you don't really do that much content, but if they were to connect with you, let's say they wanna work on one of your teams, if they're recruiting, uh -huh. like where can they connect with Brian online? Yeah, I mean, the best way to probably get a hold of me is just through Instagram DMs. It's actually nice because I don't do any really personal brand stuff right now. Uh -huh. I can check all my Instagram DMs. And so whether you wanna potentially come work for one of my companies or if you wanna go through Cole and I's sales training, I can point anybody in either of those directions. Where can they find you on Instagram? Uh, it's just Brian underscore Ostermiller. Okay, cool. We'll put it in the link in the description as well. Guys, I know you enjoyed the podcast. Share this with someone that's starting out that you feel like would resonate with the content because we bring these podcasts to you completely for free. And if you haven't checked out my B5 Masterclass yet, shoot me a DM on Instagram, B5, and I'll give it to you guys completely for free. I am Bridget Rogers. This is Bridging the Gap, and together we will bridge the gap. Hell yeah, Until bro. next time. All right, congratulations. If you made it to the end of the video, you're a one percenter. So do me a favor, do a couple things for me. Number one, share this with someone that you feel like would get tremendous value from this video. And then number two, we've got content that'll help you level up and bridge the gap in multiple areas of life. Your belief systems, your mindset, your body, your business, your brotherhood, your babe. So all you gotta do is hit the link right here to watch my most recent video on how to bridge the gap with your belief system, with your body, with your business, with your brotherhood, and help you find a babe. See you guys in the next video.